you know. So, but it, it's there's the same point. In it. There is something uh, in the integrity of a work of art, which kind of resists your mixing effort, yeah. you know, and and it is a disservice to yourself, uh, kind of not to allow this to to stay after you mixed. With you mean like permanent steps, right? Also, the point is, the point is, you should have your fun, but after you left, the lady should still be <laughs> okay. Well, let's put it this way: the ice is melting, and the, um, so and the ice is actually uh, such a point. The ice will have its own dignity still. It's gone after you. No, 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 no. <laughs> you are, you are maybe want to claim to know too much. No, no. Look yeah. at the mountains. There is no. Yeah, but, 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 Wait 200 years, maybe there will be more ice there than, uh, than ever before. Yeah, yeah, the, the global warming. There'll be goats know, up there. We are still not sure if this is a per periodic thing or not. We just treat it like it might be. Okay. It's our fault. And so let's do something about it. But we could be wrong. I think it's going to be going on. Yeah, okay. The I mountains. And, and didn't you see from last year? It's much more ice and snow this no, time. There's dust from the Sahara <laughs> Desert. <laughs> 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 anyway, <laughs> open up to you guys, please. Yes. Okay. Um, you were talking about, you know, when you said, oh, now you're the director as a DJ, which um, points to a, a role reversal in terms of is the artist the creator or the romantic genius and all of that. And then the role reversal means that you, you're basically put yourself as artist as a producer. Yeah. And then you make a comparison with, you know, the early 20th century where, you know, that fellow in the film was the actor the producer played all the roles. However, um, it reminded me of Warhol in the factory, where um, in the factory years, Warhol said, you know, I'm not the artist, I'm going to be the producer, not even the director, but the producer. And I was wondering, um, what do you think? Do you, do you see yourself in some ways further in that, um, this idea of the artist as producer that actually, you know, from American pop art? Or what is your affiliation with that? What do you think about yeah, Warhol's a very important figure for me, mainly because he, he has this very famous phrase from A to B and back again. So a lot of his stuff was about loops. Um, and he would use the same image and just say it's the same but different. That was literally his phrase. Um, and he was able to kind of look at that as re visual repetition, like the same way you'd break apart a part of film still. Like you'd see someone moving a little bit depending on 48 frames per second, but he'd take all 48 frames and make them into 48 paintings and make money off of all of them. But um, no, he's brilliant with that. I mean, uh, but at the same time, with digital media, you're seeing the dematerialization that art has been really rigorously uh, been going through with software. I mean, um, I live in Tribeca, for example, and one of my neighbors is a gentleman by the name of Richard Serra. He's a major sculptor. He draws a couple scrawls. The assistants make a, a diagram, put it into a CAD file. They send it to a battleship armor manufacturer as a, as a high resolution file. And two weeks later, somebody gets a 20 ton piece of steel on their doorstep. You know, but the, he's still an, a physical sculpture guy, you know, and he would be, he would burst into flames if you said he's using software, but he is. Or so, so is Frank Gehry for those weird curves. You couldn't do those by hand and make those buildings. I mean, you can look at Gaudi, you know, the architect, uh, really interesting architect who played with fragments, but um, the complexity of Gehry's buildings, I'm sure most of you guys have seen the, the I don't know, the Guggenheim Bilbao or the LA Opera House. Um, each of those is separately machine made using software and a deeply complex uh, series of analysis to see the, where the stress points on the metal are so the metal stays in place. All sorts of really interesting uh, kinds of uh, things that would not be possible you know, uh, even 20 to 30 years ago. But um, that doesn't mean that software has enabled a new thing. It's actually, I think, given some of the older things that were conceptual before a physical form that they can now be much more uh, stronger, you know, so uh, that doesn't mean, when I'm saying the roles that you're talking about consolidating, the roles have always been there, like you have someone who was a storyteller, there was a bard who told stories to the king, or somebody who uh, traveled around in, in Europe and, you know, drank mead with knights or something, and, you know, they would tell stories, and there was the griot in West Africa and, and China, every culture usually had a kind of a storyteller, but artists in the Western world were given singular identities. A lot of other cultures, the artists didn't even sign their name, you know? So, if you're in Indonesia or, ba you know, or Bali and looking at a beautiful carving, you're not going to know who made that. So, what I'm talking about is a very am ambiguous tension between art and artifact. 
and how somebody can claim identity over the making of those objects. Um, in the same way that Duchamp or Warhol or even Jeff Koons uh, were looking at found materials, um, I think DJing and using found materials from the web and looking at the web as my record collection or uh, looking at the events and I'm doing as happenings, those are, I think, valid responses to an era where we, we're just overloaded with materials right now. And it's post-production, as uh, Nicolas Boréad would say. But um, the whole notion of post-production doesn't mean that you stop making things. It's how you contextualize them. So I'd say my work is looking at a very distinct uh, connection between context and content in the same way that a director could say, let's you know, have the actors there, but like someone like Alfred Hitchcock would put himself in the scene really quick, you know, he's very famous for that, like the birds or something, where it's just, there's a flash, but you realize he's the author, he's the director, and he's in the actual you know, production. Um, I kind of like stuff like that, but at the same time, uh, there's the invisible component that once my work is out in the world, nobody cares, and they're going to just take it and run with it. So I can't control that. Um, if you guys decide to remix my stuff with Britney Spears, you know, there's nothing I can do. Um, although I'd be really pissed off. Don't do it. <laughs> but, um, you know, once the object is out there, that means that the artist is an open source font. You can just take it and make new versions of that, you know, whatever you want. So certain beats, uh, certain structures and rhythms, techno, drum and bass, all of those are, they're fonts. They're audio rhythm fonts that people can take and change. Um, the other problem with that is that on one hand, you have standardization because so many people are taking a very easy route and making very simple techno beats or hip hop beats, and you know um, the, it's like a 50 cent album or basic techno, or, you know, just stuff that you feel like there's not that level of creativity. There's a reason because everyone's using the same software, and they're not tweaking the software, or changing it, or doing stuff. Um, and that can be very. I can hear like the Pro Tools edit or the the Audio Logic drum roll or something, you know, like kind of weird stuff like that. Um, that doesn't mean that it's bad, it just means that it's boring. But I, I like, I like uh, saying that there should be a conflict in roles, there should be friction, there should be um, a rigorous and um, engaging sense of not accepting norms, because that's right now, it's like, do you all want to live in a Starbucks world? Or, well, so, I like green tea from Starbucks, but uh, I don't know. But I don't want to have a standardized planet where everything is the same. You know, that's, um, That'd be really boring. So yeah, the roles thing is very important because people have to say, we have to update, we have to understand radically different cultures and see what other people are doing. And that's, that's more of an open system. Uh -huh. It's just one question first. Uh, about the critics film, did you buy the, did you buy the exhibition rights of the film totally from the live period you bought the book, the other character in Japan? No, different context. Um, the, just for, for reference, I'll repeat your question. Um, Pierre Uyghig did this project. Uh, what was the woman's name? It was a, it was a Japanese anime character. Yeah. And he, what's that? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's going to be here in a couple of days. He's an old associate. I, I gave him advice for his document uh, project last time. But um, he is operating in a copyright system because that doll, or the, the, the character, is very recent. Birth of a Nation is from 1915. So there's, again, a very intense copyright regimen in place in the US. But 1915 makes the film public domain. And because he had left, yeah, no, I, I had to deal with lawyers and everything. Right, so What's that? Yeah, so, so did he die before the 70 year rules? The film was officially documented as being placed in a copyright regimen around 1915. Right. So I, got, I approached Bruce Jenkins, who's the head director of Harvard University's film archive. And Bruce um, looked through their legal relationships and said it would work. Then we, there's a really renowned um, historical art house film a uh, production house called Criterion Films. And we found a very rare print that was out of circulation that no one owned. And uh, we were owed a favor, and I was working with producers of The Simpsons. They can make phone calls. Uh, they have, the Simpsons is one of the biggest cartoons on the planet, so they have, you know, they have clout. So um, I'm Mr. Indie Artsy, but uh, a very commercial guy I was able to make a phone call. And next thing you know, we had a free copy <laughs> of a uh, very early, good quality print of Birth of a Nation that we made a high definition print of. So I own the rights to the digital print, but the actual original one that I made, no one's going to see anymore. 